You're still watching a continuing coverage of our special program of a special program on uh, scoring the government on its performance so far. We can cross over back to them. Evans Mensa and Efia Pokia are on. They're talking about social interventions. With his own policy and uh, infrastructure, and it's quite a laborious one, which means that the party may have taken you know, time to do that. Now, they form even a committee in government, I'm sure as part of cabinet, which is chaired by the Minister for Railways, uh, Honorable Joe Gatti. Now, Joe Gatti and his team came up with this whole policy for infrastructure, uh, encompassing all the areas under infrastructure. So after it outdoored this um, policy, basically what the party or government was trying to do is that it was going to improve on the infrastructure that Ghana had at the time. And it, it goes into the various um, segments. Let me take you to roads and highways where they say that um, government is going to tar all gravel roads in areas of high population density, a great production for, and for tourism potential. So you may want to focus on um, areas that come to mind that have tourism potential, a great production if you come from any of those areas. And in your mind assess whether MPP has been able to do well or otherwise in the last um, almost two years in government. Then government also itemized other ones that it will do and says that we shall widen major arterial roads into multi-lane carriage, construct lay bypass and dedicate um, traffic lanes for high occupancy buses and all that. You understand that um, BRT or the bus rapid transport system was introduced by the same MPP government under President Kufo, which was continued by... When you take them to other areas, for instance, railways, and we've seen MPP doing some work in the railways industry. They said that according to the Infrastructure Committee Chairman, which is Honorable Joe Gatti, a government of the MPP will completely overhaul the railway sector with a promise to revamp Western and Eastern lines. We shall also expand the railway network from Kumasi to Paga. We will build the Tama Akosomo rail line and tie it into a revived and expanded water lake transport system. This is an opportunity for government um, for the transport of goods and services from the south to um, the north. And so this is what government is saying. Again, it takes us to another seg sector in the infrastructure industry, which is aviation. And government says that regarding the aviation sector, uh, we will um, make our airports international, regional uh, hubs. We shall also increase domestic air travels as part of our integrated transport um, system. We will achieve this through policies such as improving, increasing our transport infrastructure generally and reducing the price of aviation fuel and abolishing the 17.5 and uh, VAT on domestic airfares. Now, tell me if you've seen this abolishing of um, um, VAT on domestic airfares, if you've recently traveled on maybe African World or Starbo or any of the domestic airlines. Now, let me take you to what happened. Now, briefly, it says that um, considering uh, the fact that a large number of Ghanaians do not have access to portable water, um, under our Water for All agenda, we seek to ensure that every Ghanaian has access to portable water. We shall, among other things, sink at least 25,000 new boreholes, 300 small town water supply systems, and upgrade the antiquated water supply systems in our towns and city. Now, I have the former mayor here, so <clears throat> the party also... I, I, itemizes what it wants to do to resolve the flooding issue. We all know what happened on June 3rd and, and what everybody um, fears because it, this year, around the same time, we had a flooding situation, not the same as June 3rd though. So it says that government cannot continue to have a knee-jerk reaction to the perennial flooding in Accra and other parts of um, Ghana. In the short term, the party intends to construct a storm drain in Accra and other cities to deal with the recurrent devastating floods. As a long-term measure, uh, and a permanent solution. Uh, the minister also says that they want to establish a national hydrological authority, an authority that will plan, develop, and maintain, protect, and ad whole nation. We've had Minister for Water Resources Works and Housing, Honorable Atache, hinting that government will need a certain amount of money to at least even deal with the flooding situation in Accra. I'm talking about the circle issue, which we saw last year. Lots of people die after the flooding situation there. Then they speak about ICT that they want is part of government's whole infrastructure issue. The government will deal with this. We've seen how government is trying to use NITA and other institutions to deal with it. Whether or not they've managed to achieve, that's up to you to tell us and our panel members. Then let me take you to another critical issue, affordable housing. 
And it's a very controversial issue because we know that under President Kufo, when affordable housing was started, it kind of froze under subsequent government. So under this new LPP-led government, led by uh, His Excellency Nanado Danko Kufuad, what are they going to do? Have we seen anything? Now, they say that the party intends to provide service land banks for real estate companies and individuals uh, for development after tax incentives for local real estate developers and producers for bu of building materials to also abolish the 5% VAT on real estate sales and work with identifiable groups such as TUC, Ghana National Association of Teachers, National Association of Graduate Teachers, NAGRAT, and pharma groups and other, others to facilitate the construction of homes for member people. So these are basically the areas that, as a government, MPP captures and intends to build infrastructure. If yeah, there was also it. some other areas, and as part of the conversation, expanding it beyond infrastructure, there was sunny, which is part of, I guess, the reason why uh, Nathaniel Matafio is joining us today as well, because of his expertise in that area, which has been a big deal. If you look at what the government said they will do and when they were in opposition, their manifesto on sanitation, and sure, and just quoting from the 2016 manifesto of the NPP, ensure the consolidation of all existing national sanitation policies, plans, and programs into a comprehensive national sanitation program and action plan and establish a national sanitation fund to fund this. I mean, that is so direct. I guess we'll, if uh, that fund has been established, we'll, we'll know by now. And uh, that's something that we'll be looking into. But also, on the area, if you look at the topic, there's also social intervention programs. And if you look at the NPP manifesto, they, they had an elaborate plan for social intervention. And then something that we haven't touched on March today, which they said they would do. In fact, it was number one on the list of social intervention programs they said they would do, which is amend the Disability Act to bring it into line with the UN Convention on Disability and pass appropriate legislative instruments for the implementation of the Mental Health Act and the Disability Act. But also, they said, and this is on LEAP, and I had earlier this morning that came up, and it says, refocus the LEAP program, which has become a blatant source of political testing, uh, accurate means testing, to target, identify, and enroll uh, properly, bene I mean, uh, uh, properly beneficiary households. And it goes on to say that also institute measures to reduce administrative costs of the Ghana show, uh, uh, school feeding program, which we know has, has also been bedeviled with some challenges uh, to, the, to, the, to the barest minimum, and stimulate local agricultural growth by requiring caterers to buy and use foodstuff grown locally from local farmers. And some of these, and social intervention is very broad. So you can even put in free SHS under social intervention. They've, in fact, also, in fact, they listed a number of the things they wanted to revamp, such as, quoting, National Youth Employment Program, the Capitation Grant, the National Health Insurance Scheme, and the health conversation that came up as well, uh, free maternal care, microfinance and small scale, uh, small loan center, mass log, mass cocoa spraying exercise, which we touched on. But this is important. The Metro Mass Transport Service was a key, key social intervention that the MPP said in your manifesto they will be revamping. So Evans, again, let me also um, highlight this point that last year, the Ghana Institution of Engineers um, did an assessment of the infrastructure sector. And um, Senior Minister Onobo Yasaf Mafo was a guest of honor. He was emphatic that for the year 2016, the report card actually graded Ghana D3, which is poor, and he agreed. So it's important that we start the conversation on that level, that as of 2016, our report card said, as far as our infrastructure sector was concerned, our grade was 3D. We had performed poorly. So the issue is, what is the assessment of MPP in the infrastructure sector? Two years, almost two years in government. So let me introduce the panel again, and, and this um, evening we are glad to uh, work with some very, very experienced people who will be here uh, helping us to do um, this discussion. Uh, the country director for Send Ghana and co-chair of uh, CSO's platform on SDGs, Mr. George Usu Bimpe is here with us. Mr. Usu Bimpe, thank you very much for, you. for joining us. Osei Bimpe, okay. Okay, thank you for the correction. Now, Mr. Um, the, an architect and a former mayor of Accra, for a lot of the young people, maybe you didn't uh, meet him, but this man was one of the very, very, very bold men 
and mayor of Accra those days, Nat Nunu Amatefio. Boss, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We know you are, you've retired from active politics, but anything that concerns national development, you are very, very active um, a partaker of it. Mr. Apia uh, Kusi Adomako is from the center. Um, he's a center coordinator for CATS International Ghana. Thank you for joining us. Should I do a correction? No. Uh, it's, it's, cool. it's correct. Thank you very much. So th we appreciate your time. So uh, Mr. Amatefio, let me start with you. Being a former mayor of Accra, let me push you to de infrastructure development in the capital and we will spread it to the rest of the nation. What will be your assessment of government almost two years in office as far as infrastructure in the capital is concerned and we will spread it to the rest of the country? Percentage-wise or what? Percentage-wise. If you can do percentage-wise, that would be very fine for us. Uh, they have continued rather seamlessly from what the NDC had been doing the previous administration. So we have seen the continuation of major road networks. Uh, the situation about flooding is to some extent beyond simply building gutters and drainage. It also involves a lot of public education. And that portion, I'm not quite sure that it uh, they succeeded very well. But I know from experience that it's something that takes time, constant application. So if you don't see immediate results, you don't jump to conclusions. You just wish them better luck next time. Uh, so as a matter of giving them a grade, one can only say they've done as well as can be expected. Wish they had done more, but for two years, let's give them uh, a B average. B average? Yes. B average. That is, uh, are you looking at Greater Accra alone or nationwide infrastructure? I have the kind of myopia associated with people who live in capital cities. We think that beyond the capital cities, there isn't much going on. Mm. But I'm sure that we are wrong. Uh, yes, in Accra, they've not done badly. The major cities, the connecting roads to them seem more than just adequate. Mm. But I'm not quite sure what the condition is beyond this matrix, then going into the more rural hinterland. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Um, uh, Kusi Adomako, let me take your views on that general infrastructure, in indicating all the areas that we've touched on, water, power, housing, and all that. How would you assess MPP? Okay. Thank you very much, Ifua. So I will say I'll continue from where my former mayor ended. Two years is a short time to assess the performance of a government when it comes to infrastructure. Infrastructure financing requires a lot of time. You can't go for a short term uh, borrowing to finance the infrastructure. And we've seen that government is trying to do an unconventional means of financing infrastructure. And that is kind of taking it time and so recently we heard of government trying to do a better deal with the Chinese uh, companies to get funds to do infrastructure development. And so it will be difficult to synchronize what they have pledged and what has been done. We've not seen that much of infrastructure development around, but we also have to understand, before coming here, we did a lot of research at our office to look at investment infrastructure of various governments. And you see that during their first term, in the first term, we don't see that much because they spend a lot of time stabilizing the economy. And then during their second term, then a lot of uh, funds goes into infrastructure development. Mm. And I think that same analogy can be extended for this particular discussion. 
But I think that uh, if you don't accra, you find that most of the roads in our the arterial roads are not in a good shape. So for this reason, you don't always wish it rains in the city because if it rains in the city, everything will go away. So infrastructure, I will, uh, it's a midterm. So it's a midterm now uh, for this particular assessment, and I think I will give them a C plus. On, C plus. Yes. Well, that's good enough. If C you're putting plus. that on the scale of zero to ten. What would that translate into? Okay, five on the average. Okay, five. that's average. That's average. Mr. Mr. Bimper, would you be kind? Do you seem to agree with this general trend? It appears that everybody's saying that for infrastructure, it's, it's, it's quite too early, too early to assess government. So the argument um, Ms. Ozu is making is that, say, maybe in the second term of the government, if the government should get another term, I'm, I'm not sure about that, but that's up to the voters to decide whether they will give government another term or not. Do you agree with that? And what will be your rating as well? Okay, thank you. The aspect that I agree with, the aspect that I do not agree Okay. Um, I agree that it takes a lot of time to do technical preparations. It takes a lot of time to finance. But we have entered into social contrast, uh, contract with government. Government has said to us that within the four-year period. This is what they are going to provide. So it is on the basis of that, that social contract, that I would... You're still watching a special program on evaluating the performance of the MPP administration two years so far. We're just talking about infrastructure and social interventions. If you're up here, of course, and Evans Mensah are handling that. We can go back and listen to them. He says that Getting funding is difficult. Already statistics show that we will need about $7.3 billion yeah, to that, deal with the infrastructure deficit. Exactly. So, Is it realistic to get so it in two years? Formed, what informed the promises? What informed the promises to Ghanaians? We, we are non-technocrats. We, we didn't know, but we were promised something as Ghanaians. So if we are judging, so, so let's get the contest right. We are only assessing the government on the basis of what they promised us. Is that not what we are doing? We are not talking about general infrastructure delivery or how it, so, but government was aware when they were making those promises. So it is on that basis that I would say that um, infrastructure delivery is one of the critical areas that the MPP government has not done well. And I think that we must face it as it is and then get them to deliver before we go to the next post. And I think that is the essence of this assessment. Okay. Okay. And uh, on that basis, if you ask me to grade from yeah. one to um, one to ten, I will, I will give three point five. Three point. Now I just pulled up the budget, okay. and the budget sort of gave you an assessment of what they've done. Three hundred and eighty-eight you know, million so allocated. I just, I just, I just want to just ninety-five million. I just want to, I just want to cite a few. So on railway, mm -hmm. he says, like, and this is the finance minister talking. Now let me turn my attention to the development of the railway infrastructure in Ghana. He says, government in 2018 commenced the rehabilitation of the existing 56-kilometer narrow gauge line from Kojokrom to Takwa through Insuta Corridor to restore passenger rail and freight services for the first time since 2007. This will be completed, he says, in 2019. So in 2018, they say they started that, that line, and it goes on. Uh, work also commenced on rehabilitation works on the 70.8 kilometer narrow gauge sections of the Eastern Railway Line from Accra to Insawam, Accra to Tema. The Achimota Tema section is 90% complete, and Achimota to Accra uh, Central and Achimota to Insawam uh, will be completed by end of 2018, so which is by 31st December, mm -hmm. it should be done. Okay. Rehabilitation will continue to Kufruria in 2019, and then finally, feasibility studies for the uh, for the proposed 596 kilometer Greenfield railway line from Kumasi to Paga, popularly known as the Central Spine, has been undertaken. Mm -hmm. So that's what they've done, yeah. and that phase one from Kumasi to Bupe section will commence in 2019. Mm -hmm. you, 
on the back of the railway, for example, that if you are mentioned, it, how does that fit into your assessment? So for example, I, based on what they claim they've done, what what they claim they've done in twenty yeah. in so, twenty eighteen. So I go to the budget, yeah, and I look at how much has been allocated to the railway sector, yeah. mm. and that is ninety five million. How much how much of this would ninety five million accomplish? That's a question we need 95 million cities. cities. Okay. How much of this will 95 million cities accomplish? So it is good that I have seen the rehabilitation. But the, I think the, 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 the critical issue is that we need to quicken the pace of infrastructure development in this country. And the way we are going about it, it doesn't appear to be a priority. And that is where I come from. So yes. There are some rehabilitation work ongoing that I have seen, but they're big work. Something that will address a major spatial disparity issue between the north and the south. We may have finished the, um, the feasibility study, but that is a paperwork. When are we going to start? What are the progress markers or the benchmarks in the budget? That shows that within um, the next 20, uh, 2019, by the end of 2019, we would have got into Tachima or another area. Mm -hmm. Where are those things? I think but but Mr. Bimpel, shouldn't you be looking at that in the context of the broader, say, transport or railway policy? That this is something that Ghana has been doubling with, and we've been going back and forth in the railway industry. Because I understand under President um, Kufu, we are the Ministry for Port Service and Railway. Mm. We managed to get $5 million for OPEC funding, which couldn't do that much. Under President uh, Mills, there was a reconstruction of, say, the railway line between Tema and Asopochona, which I saw the movement of the, um, uh, of the train. But this is uh, what government is saying right now in this policy is that this is not rehabilitation, but also a construction. Mm -hmm. and, and the Minister for Railways have be, has been seen on camera doing actual new construction. Yeah. For instance, in Tema, yeah. where I live, there's, shouldn't you be looking at this in the broader context of say that we've made progress somehow? Yeah, I think that when you are assessing an institution, oftentimes you don't use alien standard. Okay. And it will not be fair to compare them to previous government. We are using their own standard to judge them. So you give me, you take me to Kumasi within two weeks. In the course of the two weeks, or half, halfway past um, one week or so, you have taken me to only in Sawem. How do I know that I'll get to Kumasi by the end of the two weeks? That's the basis of my analysis. So if they have said they will deliver all of the, uh, the, the list that you read out, where are they two years into their four-year term? That is, for me, the analytical framework that I'm using, rather than to use a certain government to judge them, because we are not talking about two different governments. We are talking about the current government. Current government said they will deliver infrastructure. I am saying only that the rate or the pace is you know, slow. And if we, if we really want to get to where they want to get to by the end of the four-year term, they will need to quicken the pace. And uh, Uncle Natuna Matefi, I want to bring you in on the question of, of, of what we just had. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, I just want to alert also that uh, we also want to bring in social intervention programs and sanitation, which is also very important in the conversation. And so if you want to, I wanted to take the sanitation question, which is a big one. Um, with the minister were recently moved and reshuffled and, and changed. There's a new minister there. And we know the president has been bold in declaring uh, that uh, he's going to make Accra one of the you know, neatest cities in Africa. Are we, well, what's your assessment of how, the way they performed in terms of sanitation, knowing that you were once the mayor of this great city that is engulfed in filth almost all the time? Do you really want me to answer you after insulting me like that? <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> I mean, you want me to answer about as a government with sanitation, and then tell me my city was in <laughs> No, your city was better than now, I guess. Is that, does, that, does that help? Well, uh, <laughs> I always honestly find it difficult to answer these questions on sanitation, because I realize how very, very difficult it is to acquire the level of sanitation that we think we deserve here. Uh, certainly, 
in the last year or two, I think the level of sanitation in certain parts of Accra had deteriorated. In the usual upper income areas, the sanitation is still quite good. Airport residential area, cantonment, ridge, blah, blah. Sanitation is quite good. Uh, along the Kanishi, Kaswa, Spine, it's terrible. In other areas, it has actually regressed. <laughs> All right? But on the other hand, I see greater efforts being put into trying to arrest the situation. There's this three-wheeled vehicle. I don't know what they call it. Is, it, is that the same thing as uh, Aboso Kain? <laughs> Macho? Yeah, what? I hear it's Mahama Kambu. Mahama Kambu. Mahama Kambu. <laughs> I see a lot more of it. Uh, but also, the con population have grown quite a lot. I mean, you don't have to do a head count to know that Accra is much more populous this year than it was last year. Uh, the number of spontaneous housing, that means the kiosks, etc., have also expanded exponentially. So government is running very fast to stay in the same place. OK, having made all those qualifications, what was your question here? <laughs> <laughs> so so having, having, having said all that, your assessment is what, over the last two years, with what they said they would do, one of the things they said they would do is to set up a sanitation fund to deal with, with the problem. I don't think they've succeeded in achieving their aims, but I'm willing to give them a good recommendation for trying. And if they continue along the lines in which they're going now, I expect that by this time next year, we ought to see quite a big difference. But, but Uncle Amatevi, why are, we, are you giving them a good recommendation? Because you speak about population increase, which we can't claim not to have been aware of it. Population Council gives statistics and forecasts into the future the, what the population of Accra will grow to be. The areas that have you know, regressed, we know the number of people who will be living in the, the area. MPP had the manifesto. They had a plan to fix it. So why are you giving them a recommendation for a good try? Because they deserve to be encouraged. <laughs> is, is that not a failure? Is, is that not a failure, rather? That having known the situation, especially because MPP has been in government before, NDC has come, it, or, or are, you, are you afraid to... Somebody will cite you as a former mayor and say that maybe you didn't do your best during your time? Well, that's your assessment of it. No, not my assessment. I'm just playing the devil's advocate. <laughs> well, I'm talking as somebody who has occupied that position. Consequently, I'm very careful about how I assign blame. It's too easy to sit outside and to make those denunciations. Very, very easy. Uh, it's much more difficult sitting there trying to achieve these results, okay? Take something like hawkers on the streets, mm. a major source of dropping uh, in creating sanitary situations. Any mayor in Accra who have tried to get rid of them has come under tremendous political pressure. You can't run away from that. Many of our critics had been major media houses like Joy FM. You heard of them, haven't you? 
like what we are doing right now. So Critiquing. So, and you're doing your job. Thank you. You're doing your job. But you should be more careful how you try to trick former mayors into helping you <laughs> do, do that job. <laughs> Are you applauding because you agree with me? Yeah. <laughs> oh, so you think I'm tricking him to answer the questions? Yeah. <laughs> you, you see? An unexpected hilarity, levity into the discussion. But then these are real issues which we have to tackle face on. The same people who say a cry is too filthy react very negatively when you try to remove the source of that filth. And until Joy FM is willing to go over to the people who are obstructing our efforts and shake them by their lapel, then they, we don't have a level playing ground. Government is not succeeding because the whole of the society is in denial. But you cannot have a city as squeaky clean as you imagine unless you're willing to take some very strong steps. And until we are all willing as a society to take those strong steps, then our clean cities remain. <laughs> I'm thanking you. Yes, okay. I'm thanking you, and I'll, I'll bring the um, the audience in to comment on. I think that they are they are they seem to be in love with you this evening. So can't help um, it. I'm, <laughs> I'm so handsome. But you are, you are, <laughs> you are. So on sanitation, I think I will give the current administration 3.5, which is a oh, failure. Earlier he scored B plus. He, he scored five yes. earlier on infrastructure. Yeah. Do a lot of talk has been said about uh, sanitation. We have a, a new ministry, Ministry of Sanitation, but nothing has been achieved in terms of the results. And I think that uh, we can also not blame the administration alone the success of a cleaner city is a, is a function of both the demand and the supply side. Even if government is to equip the sanitation workers and, and the people in the city are going to later and make their work difficult, we will still see death around. And so what I would say is that more needs to be done, behavioral changes, and that is what has not been done. Government thinks that uh, uh, pumping money into the sector will result in a cleaner city, but research has shown that it is not so. Behavioral change is the most important way of fighting, I mean, sustaining a cleaner city. You go to cities like Kigali and Nairobi, and if you compare their sanitation budget, it is nowhere near what we are spending, and it is the their output, their outcome is better than that of us. And so we, the people living in the cities, you, you go to Accra here, anywhere you see garbage, and you ask yourself, even if we were to bring angels to come and clean the city tonight, mm. tomorrow morning, people will still make the place dirty. Mm. So we cannot only cite the blame, but then because they are in government, they, the power rests upon them. They have all the institution of state to enforce law and order, so I'll still give them the 3.5. Okay, Mr. Bimpe, um, particularly because um, Uncle Amate, you and Mr. Pia have both spoken about leadership in this matter. You know, that everybody's complaining, oh, attitude, attitude, yes, we agree. But somebody's got the power, as Mr. Pia ended uh, his uh, comment by saying, somebody has the power to enforce the bylaws. So why are we in the situation in which we are? Okay, thank you very, uh, very much. Uh, before, but before I come there, I think that since we are assessing, uh, there is both a positive and negative side to the creation of the ministry. 
uh, I mean, on the positive side, it gives a sense of government focus on addressing sanitation problem. But uh, negatively, it only increases the cost, the transactional problem. So you want to ask yourself whether you want to still uh, add it to the, the ministry that was, uh, you know, uh, originally mandated to do that or not. What has changed since we separated and created Local a different from, ministry? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one, one big thing that we need to ask. And then what is the extent of collaboration between that ministry and the local government ministry? Since a sanitation service delivery is largely that of the responsibility of the local government. And this is where I answer your question to say that oftentimes because of partisan consideration and the desire to win elections in the next election, or even from the day that the government is sworn in, government appears hesitant in enforcing the law. Can we get government to take bold decision to say that they are banning pollutant bag, as that is one major source of you know, pollution in Ghana? Just as other countries appear cited Rwanda, they have done it. Why is it that we cannot do? And how do we, what is the model that we will uh, deploy to do, to do that? There are people who are manufacturing pollutant. They will say that they are going to lose their livelihood. How can we build their capacity to begin to go into paper manufacturing so that it will solve that problem if they are going to agitate for which politicians are going to recoil into the shares? And that, that's, people have noticed that, I mean, the business people have noticed that once they make noise, the politicians will certainly recoil because they are afraid or they are threatened to, you know, with, with the, the power of Kokromoti. Therefore, they wouldn't want to go ahead with that. And it seems, it seems that the tragedy or the trend has no change. They are simply afraid to enforce the, the, the laws. If they were, um, it will be difficult for people's attitude to continue the way they are. I mean, people have had this attitude because nobody is you know, there to take them on. If we can go back to the Nsaman Saman days, if we can go back to um, people becoming more nationalistic and being, being caring about the environment, that is something that we need to do. Maybe it's not about just doing the usual radio sensitization, but having this embedded even in the education system, having this um, done with you know, the religious bodies, for them to see that you cannot claim to be a Muslim or a Christian or a traditionalist for that matter, but polluting the very property that the almighty God has given to you. Something practical as that will make people very responsible to the environment. Whilst we are enforcing laws, and making the assemblies also deliver on their mandate in terms of... So your grade in sanitation would be... Uncle, I'm I, I would not, I will not differ from uh, my brother uh, 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 up here. I think, I think 3.5 is a... What, is what a would good. you... How would you grade the separation of the Ministry of Sanitation from local governments? I think, I, I, I think they are giving the enormity of the problem. It's, it's okay. Just but at the moment, it is not delivering. So that's where the problem is. Probably that justification that the president put up when he was creating that ministry, you know, doesn't come out because they are, we know that we are engulfed in filth in Accra and in Kumasi on, and, and almost everywhere in Ghana. So, so there must be something wrong with that. If probably they would want to look at it, that would be good because at the moment, the... the, the, the Thank you very much, Mr. Bimpe. Uncle, you had a rebuttal because I saw that you reached for your microphone. Oh, just a reflex action. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, contrary to what you think, I am broadly in agreement with what he said mm. as to the various areas in which we can start to activate a reaction the religious bodies. Ghanaians are very religious, at least they try to pretend they are. <laughs> and if somehow we can get into their heads that if you pollute, you will not go to heaven, it may help. <laughs> it may, all right? But this polythene bag menace it's possible to do at least three shops in Accra. And I'm not quite sure whether it's ethical to give them, to name them, because we'll be giving them 
unfair publicity, who no longer serve anything in polythene bags, but serve it in paper bags. Paper bags. Uh, I'm sure paper bags are the density or the weight is much more expensive than the polythene bags. So I have no doubt they are absorbing some loss now. But I really believe that we as a government should start making it mandatory that no more plastic bags as we used within our territorial borders and insist that all merchandise should be in paper bags or paper containers. Uh, it should be possible to do so. Around this. But a lot of public education will have to be enforced and go into it. Otherwise, you are backing against the moon. Mm. Thank you, Uncle. Um, well, let me remind um, listeners and viewers that we're still live on Joy 99.7 and Joy News. We're also online live. You can follow the discussion and share your views and comments with us. We're still assessing MPP two years, almost two years into government. Now, it's important that we do this because we, we are not like the United States of America where you have midterm elections. That kind of gives, serves as a list most test for government to understand whether it is doing well or not. So it's important that as the media and being the fourth estate of the realm, we help a judge or kind of assess the system and help government whip them into line because at the end of the day, if government delivers, it delivers for the people. If it fails equally, it also fails for the people. But we want to succeed and benefit from the successes of um, the uh, government. So let me allow my brother Evans to go into roads and highways. We all know what happened recently in Medina, Accra, and subsequent areas and agitation that uh, is, is, is coming up. Evans. It's, a, it's, a big, it's a one of the biggest areas, I guess. And if you look at the uh, budget 2019, I think the finance minister himself admits that it's an area that needs some focus. And so they devoted quite some amount of money to roads and highways. And they listed a whole raft of roads that they'll be doing in 2019. I mean, just because of the importance of it. And in fact, in the, 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 in the importance of roads and highways is seen in the way the 2016 elections was run. I mean, we had the government that in the NDC that pointed, you know, almost every time to its infrastructure and roads that they built. And if you traveled, uh, I traveled to, was it in Mully National Park? And the roads that have been done, everybody had gone there, we'll see, was one of those that they pointed. And it, 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 I had somebody make the point today here at the scorecard that one of the best ways to create jobs is through infrastructure. And roads alone can create a lot of jobs because once you are constructing the roads, all these people live in the communities who will, will get employment. You know? the time frame the road has been built. And so let me start with you um, on, on that, the, the, the roads question. Okay. What, where is the NPP two years on in terms of, because roads is, a, because we, before we even come to, you know, anything else, the highways where, and I'm linking this to what we see, the carnage we've seen on the roads. Many people say a lot of the roads itself have been designed to kill. It does seriously. I mean, you need to range in the air. You need to invest, create dual carriageways, etc., etc. What's your assessment of the way the government has performed in in the road sector generally? Okay. Thank you very much. I think that, on assumption of office, one of the first steps that they took was to uh, audit uh, ongoing uh, contracts. Yeah. We don't know what has come of it. Is that where they found that that sub seven? Yeah, CDs. well, there, there are some um, some liabilities that were yeah. liabilities that well, were determined, yeah. but what action has been taken? That's a question I don't have the answer. The uh, then there, there's another side. In as much as I support that effort to determining whether those projects had been uh, inflated, which I suspected at, at that time that many of those projects had been inflated by the former government. In as much as I, I you know I supported that effort. What I would have expected was that if indeed those um, projects were, or some of them were inflated, 
what, what, what is the state of that audit? We need to know as citizens, um, given that the government also promised a transparent and accountable governance. So we need to know what has come of that and what action they are going to take thereof so that we will, have, uh, we will begin to have a culture of not inflating cost associated with road construction because it takes a whole lot of resources away uh, from other areas in terms of ensuring their um, um, distribution. The, the next point that I want to make is that um, uh, when just on the last point, the question you asked, mm -hmm. I think the recent I had the information minister say that the seven billion they trimmed it down mm -hmm. to somewhere around two billion, if I'm not mistaken. And mm -hmm. I hope I'm quoting I'm quoting my friend Kojo upon Kuma accurately, and that they've actually started paying. So they trimmed down from seven billion to some two billion, what? and they actually started paying these contractors. Well, I, I I didn't listen to him. I know that the auditor general at the time also did um, some audit. And this allowed, or uh, you know, this allowed some um, service, some 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 charges. So yeah. it may be true. I don't know, and I'm, I will not. Mm. I will not mm. argue. He, he may have the official fact, so I will not even mm. go there. But the, the point I am making is that when you hold on to that exercise and you leave a road that is in the middle of construction, and you go back, what are the cost implications? So that you are going to spend more. So, they, so, so we have cost overrun. That's something that we will need to talk about so that it will guide us going forward when we have to do a similar exercise, how do you do it in such a way that it will not incur extra cost? Because once you do that, it affects other um, you know, projects. That is, that is something that I want us to look at. Then um, there are so many roads that are not, I mean, there are so many things that are supposed to happen. Um, if you use PPP arrangement, to, for example, construct the road from Accra to Kumasi. Certainly, I think there are some studies have, pro you know, have proved that you will be able to cover. So why is it that people are not interested in that? And that we continue to have a situation where we use single lane road and people are dying on that. And I think that that's something that uh, I expected that by this time we would have seen some critical um, listen, let's, let's take so you some- want the private sector involvement in the construction I think, of roads? I think that is very, that's the way out because the reality is that the cost of infrastructure delivery is so much that government alone cannot do it. What is it that they are deploring to ensure that private sector will participate? That has been at the level of the talk, but the, the, the reaction you know, is not happening. And that is the point I am making, that government needs to hasten whatever that they are doing to get the private sector to be fully involved so that it becomes a culture where people can, out of their own, go and look for money, construct a road, make money out of it uh, how, and transfer. Uh, uh, be, 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 walk me through, walk, hold my hands and walk me through this. I'm a private mm. sector guy. Mm. My private sector guy, the only thing I think about is profit. Yes. Uh, why should I put my money in a road? Why, why, why am I going to make so, my money back? So look at this way. If um, um, the uh, Kakrat Mamoto way is generating thousands and probably millions of um, cities, mm -hmm. why wouldn't a private person put in his or her money to rehabilitate it, make it more travel all year round. People will not come. So you tow it. People, yes. People, so I get my money from the exactly. tow. Exactly, you tow it. You tow it, and that's what that's what that's that, that's what ought to be the way out. Mm. And um, because we have been talking about PPP arrangement in terms of operationalization of it, we don't see so much of it um, at the level, the critical infrastructure, um, you know, provision level. And that is where I expect that government, being um, um, a, you know a capitalist-oriented government, would do better in mm. terms of engaging the private sector to come into. Road, road construction. And I think the critical issue of the cost of road construction, we need to address that. Could we have done much with, I mean, with, with what we are doing? And that's why I also like the idea that under this government, the Auditor General is going to do a construction audit. Where now we will be looking at government will be interested to look at, and I think this is something we need to say it's a good thing from the government, that they are now going to audit the road that people have constructed. If it is five inches of uh, bitumen or whatever they call it, is it actually five inches so that you are getting what you are, I mean, you, we, we, value we are for getting money. value for money. That's one thing that we begin to do. Because if you look back, many of the roads that we constructed have deteriorated um, you know, few years into their lives, and, and which means that we are not getting value for money. Who is certifying those roads for, for government to pay them? 
we need to go back and take those people you know, to account because uh, apparently some people are not doing their work. And, and that's why it rains once and we have portals overnight. For me, that is one thing that I expect government to address. The, the, the issue about you know, open contracting, the, the way we, you know, we procure, I mean, the procurement processes around road, it's a bit shrouded in secrecy. And if we are talking about open governance, we need to find a way to even do e-procurement. E we know that who, we know who, whoever is bidding. I said this, and we the essence of, um, I mean, some of us Bipe, looking for the... greater accountability and transparency in the way we manage contract uh, procurement in the road sector. But Mr. Bimpe, does the law, the procurement law not address this? Because there are thresholds it gives in various contracts. It, it, it requires that it's published in the national dailies. Yes. They are giving times for uh, people to submit their tender. There's a, a, a tender committee at various levels. Yeah. Does not know work for transparency? Yes, it does. But um, do people have, um, the, the, the point I'm making is, how do you make it more open and more transparent? What I know elsewhere in other jurisdictions is that you will see that my sister, Fia Pokia, has put in a bid. And these are her quotations. What we often hear is, what they tell us? How do we verify whether, indeed, that is the truth or not? Given that we have political entrepreneurs in this Ghana, who fund political parties with the expectation that <laughs> they will be given the juicy contract. And we have heard so many of them lamenting that they are not getting the contract. So that, that put us into a reasonable, you know, uh, uh, suspicious, uh, what do you call it, corner for us to ask those questions. And I think that if we want to uh, you know, open the governance system, these are some of the things that will get the citizens more involved in the procurement I mean, citizens should even have the power to monitor how the road is constructed in their community and should be able to feedback to government on how that is done. How have we taken advantage of social accountability uh, mechanisms that civil society groups have you know, uh, experimented with over the years to, to allow government to get the feedback beyond what the technocrat provide because we cannot so, you know, continue to rely on the supply side um, and governance system because that doesn't seem to adequately address the governance deficit we have across all sectors. Mm -hmm. And one, 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 one key sector is the road sector that we need to have a lot more uh, uh, openness. Mr. Adamo, your, your own assessment of the roads and highways uh, as far as this current government is concerned over the last two years? Okay, thank you, Evans. We've not seen much activity in the road sector. Like I said, uh, during the first two years of every government, we only hear of intentions. But for the last mid-year budget and this uh, 2019 budget, we've heard a lot of uh, allocation for new roads to be constructed. And we are sure that those roads will be constructed. But far from that, as George said, that we need to look at the ecosystem of our roads in the country. Our roads have been designed to kill, as Evans, you said. In fact, in Ghana, here, if you are traveling from Accra to Kumase, you have to even a day or two pray and fast that you go and come back safely. True. Yes. And why is this so? Because our roads are not fit for purpose. And we have engineers who should know better how to design roads that will take people to their homes, not to their graves. And, <laughs> and this is, uh, and we've lost a lot of decent Ghanaians on our roads in a preventable design, I mean, accident. And so, so, so Ms. Ms. Apia, yeah. this is a failure on the part of the system, the on system. the people, on the engineers, not necessarily government. I think you have to, you, no, we can lump, because government is top. Government uh, has powers to reform everything. So okay. I will still lump all of them together and then label them with one tag. <laughs> Yes. So I think we need to do more with our road design and make our roads more the best in West Africa. In fact, road construction in Ghana is very expensive. And when they are even constructing roads in your neighborhood, you don't even know the contractor who has been assigned the road. What type of road is that contractor going to construct? Is it going to be an asphalt or bitumen or whatever? By the time you realize a contract is signed for, let's say, an asphalted road, and then they come and do this uh, bitumen route. And because the citizens are not aware of the contract, 
or the design specifications to the disadvantage of the community uh, uh, dwellers. So this is what we need to do to ensure that we get uh, good rules. Number two, we also have to ensure that if a road is constructed and if within two or within the deferred liability, if anything happens, that contractor has to be searched. I'm yet to read or hear that a contractor has been asked to go and use his or her own money to fix a road that uh, he or she constructed. Last two years, our brother Manasseh did a road on the Eastern Corridor, and this particular, uh, uh, I've forgotten the name of the contractor, that contractor won a lot of accolade from the previous president, and later we found out that some of the portion of the road that were contracted were not good. And I don't know whether those co corrections have been amended. And you the, see, the road is still the same. It's even worse now. Yes, and, and you see, Ghanaians have become so submissive that when we use our taxpayers' money to do things that are not good, that don't result in value for money, we sit down and what? We keep quiet. I was driving yesterday in Accra and I saw this Bendy bus, the one, the bus branded. Almost all the buses that were brought into the country less than four years have broken down. And if they were to tell you the cost of those buses, you'll be surprised. Go to Europe and America, and you see buses running in the cities, the metro buses. Have been, they have reduced those buses for more than 20 years just because they, uh, they maintain them well. But here, we go and buy inferior goods and use taxpayers' money to go and buy inferior goods, and a year or two, we just pack them aside. Go to uh, Metro Mass, their warehouse, their parking lot. It's more like a junk for us. I think that government has every Monday to get the, the yellow transit system working. No excuse is as I mean, it will be accepted. If there's any engineering issue, fix it because the bus was helping a lot of people on that corridor. Let's take politics aside and get the, that uh, rapid transit system functioning. Mr. Adumakwe, is it not a failure on the people? Because I heard Uncle Amate, if you speak about the fact that people prefer politics over substance. Oh. That, for instance, what is happening currently at Etekwashi Runabout, should any government, any assembly, attempt to deal with it, we are going to be the same people. And he even lumps the media into it and say that until we talk to the people to change their attitude, you speak of the same thing. Mr. Bimpe speaks, uh, speaks of the same thing. Is it not a failure on the people? Shouldn't we be here assessing failure of the people, the voters? Why are we assessing government? Is that not the right question. Should we not throw it back to the people who you say are quiet? And we are using taxpayers' money for roads that are not even lasting three, four years. I think the power rests on government. It's when you are a leader, you are leading, you are commanding. You have the vision and the people are following you. So if you always have to turn back and look at what your people are telling you, then you end up pandering to their needs. And these needs are short term because we live in a society which my professor calls it the tyranny of the electoral cycle. So government is scared of taking hard decisions. Take the hard decisions, let's trim things, and let's win in the final run. In the short term, they may be losers. But I think that in the end, there will be more winners than losers. And unfortunately, our politicians are short termists. They are looking at the next election. And until we, the people, tell them, look, enough is enough. Uh, we, we, we are sacrificing our self-interest. Let's build a better Ghana for our, the next generation. Until we put pressure upon them, they will also give us what they want to do. Because like, left to them, they wish they are in power forever. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Apia um, um, Viewers, let me again remind you that we're still live on the scorecard, on Joy News, on Multi TV, and also on Joy 99.7 FM. Angela, also... I'm coming to you. I'll let uh, Evans Mesa go back to housing, which is a major, major, major issue. Um, young people like myself cannot afford housing. And if you try to pay mortgage, 
another wahala for you. The previous government tried to come out with a housing policy. It was enhanced to a certain level by the current ministry. Other areas, other people have spoken, uh, they've agitated. There's even a planned demonstration for 2nd December for the motorway to be lightened up, for the markings to be up and running. Because, it, like Evan says, we construct roads in Ghana to kill people. How can a highway not have road markings, not have street lights? And yet again, the attitude of the people also come in. Because the last time we tried to put up lights on the motorway, ordinary people came to steal it. But then there's also the option of solar lights, which again, the point you raise about leadership comes into play. Who in the leadership um, um, sector is taking the bold leadership role to change the lightning into solar lamps so that nobody can steal them? Mr. Montefiore, uh, let me have your take on Rose. It's a bad situation. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you're such a cool grandpa. Every time you say something, everybody reacts to it. Well, you know, after you've lived for a certain amount of time, you realize that, so what are you going to do, get all excited? No. This, I traveled away this past weekend, and it is indeed shocking. It is terrible, and people race down on it at on head of speeds. And there's every indication that the least mistake, and you're all dead. So you want my grading of government on the motorway? Not motorway, roads and highways. You see, that's too big. <laughs> there are some excellent roads in the, certainly around Accra. Uh, and then there are some very awful ones. Eh? I would get off my be nice to government the position and give them four out of ten. Four out of ten. And I expect you to applaud. <laughs> that that would be a failure. Thank you. But is that for it Greater Accra Region alone? Because earlier, uh, before we this Frankly, panel. I ought to be fair, I don't know about the road situation in other areas. It's better in other places. Mr. Bimpe, would you be kind enough to share your views with us in the rural areas? Because your NGO you worked uh, with most of the district assembly. What is the situation there? Because the panel that ended just before this one was on food and agriculture. And the major problem people have identified for that sector is transporting of the goods, the produce, from the farmlands to the market centers. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that uh, 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 um, you read out earlier was that they were going to um, tar all... Uh, they were going to pave all and tar oh, Yes, all, yes. So question... And tourist sec um, uh -huh. areas that were... For three weeks, government has been talking about what they are going to do um, with the hope that they get some money from China. That is very good. But if we are assessing government in the last two years, infrastructure provision, road is one of the areas where they are not doing much. And that is, for example, look at Kumasi roads. These were roads that were constructed about 25 years ago. One, we have not made any effort to rehabilitate them, let alone expanding them, as they said, or even maintaining the existing ones. So why is it that that is going on? So I mean, um, so if you ask me, if you push me to the wall, I would say that road 20% is what um, I mean, or two out of 10. Two out of 10. Yes, that I will give to government because that that is a bomb those days when we well because that, because you and i know that all the roads look at you talk about tourism and i come from continency um the road to lake bosom train is in a deplorable state such that it's affecting the revenue 
of the assembly itself because they have made a projection based on the tourist inflows that they are expecting. Here is a case that the road alone is discouraging people from going. It is one of, hopefully, it's one of the roads that government will be, re, 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 what do you call it, reconstructing. Until the reconstruction happens, those of us who are watching as citizens, we have not seen anything so much on the road. Let those, as if the, the, the ones that were under construction continued, the new ones that are, are supposed to come on stream be seen to be doing, I mean, to be constructed. I think that ultimately, it, it doesn't look like some of these things we have been talking about are priorities of government, at least in the last two years. What, become, what comes out is that in the 2019 budget, government is um, going to prioritize road construction. But that hasn't, has, it hasn't happened. It yet. So, so we cannot say that, it, it, I mean, they have done well. So your we will two score is them, for what? We will score them, yeah, in the last two years, two. If they do well next year, we will see what we'll do with the map. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mr. Vipe. But uh, let me do a quick... So, um, uh, Uncle um, Amate, you, you, did you give me assessment or percentage-wise? Did uh, you two, give me four? four. He gave you four. four. Yeah, he gave me four. Uh, Mr. Api Adumaku, you gave me... No, he's yes, yet to... A little bit. I think 0.5 ahead of what George gave. So, 2.5? 2.5. 3.0. 3.0. 3.0, okay, 0.5 ahead, 3.0, okay. And Mr. Bimpe, you are giving two. Two. Two, okay. two. I mean, so 0.5 ahead of that with so 2.5. So that's 2.5. Okay. That's what? rather 2.5. He's okay. giving them 2.0. So I'm giving them three. three. But let me say one thing before we run up from this session. Yeah. We've also seen that when they are doing roads, to go to Accra, for example, all the East Legon roads are her first class. And then other areas in Accra is her third class road. And when you do this, what we do is that you shift demand for housing and other things at East Legon, and you leave, so you create a kind of a, a stratification in the city. So when, as from, uh, for me, as a policy person, I would say that it's very bad for government to concentrate all their resources in one area and build East Legon and those uh, areas as a class A uh, suburb and leave others as a... I mean, in a city within the city. Uh, Mr. Bipe, uh, no, I want to uh, jump uh, to housing so that Evans will come in. Mr. Okay. Bipe, quick but comment. But I want me. to say that the tourism point you raised earlier, we, that's on the back of how much, I think 1.5 million we spent on Afrima. Mm -hmm. And then you speak about the infra poor infrastructure in tourism areas, uh, despite what MPP themselves have promised in their uh, infrastructure policy. So that's for the Minister for um, Tourism. One of these days we will have to speak to her about is why we're spending that much of money in this as against infrastructure in tourism or tourist um, sites. Uh, Mr. Bipe, just a quick but, yeah, comment. But I just wanted to um, extend uh, my brother's argument, for he seems to be talking about like Accra. Mm. But I will look at it in terms of in, 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 you know, inequity or inequality in terms of how we are undertaking infrastructure development in, uh, in Ghana. Um, it is good to read and quite refreshing, I must say, that from the budget, they seek to, I mean, government seeks to build even the, probably the first interchange in Tamale. They want to build a similar one in Takrade. Mm -hmm. That is good. But I think that we need to make sure that there is even an distribution. equitable distribution of infrastructure service provision across the country so that we do not exacerbate the situation where people will have to come from villages and their towns because they do not find what other Ghanaians find in the big cities. Mm. That ends up choking and making public service provision so difficult for the te technocrats to handle. Mm. And I think that we need to address that. And, and I think I want, I, want, I want to encourage government to even do more as they want to begin to, you know, expand, I mean, now build uh, interchange. That's not the only thing. In the allocation of the rules, it must be equally done, irrespective of whether they vote or they do not vote for a particular party or the other. Okay. Uh, China funding. Yeah. Yes. Let, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, housing now. And I want to switch this a bit before I come to the panel. Evans Mensah, a fair procure. And of course, uh, Mr. Bimpe of Sindh Ghana, Mr. Mate Fio as well, and Mr. Pia there discussing infrastructure and social services. Earlier on, they started the, the chat with infrastructure, and they've been grading government on what it's done so far. Well, they, some, they, they, they don't really go beyond the five 
mark, which for them is a pass mark. There was actually also the issue about the fact that it was too short a time to assess government as far as infrastructure is concerned. But there was also a part of the panel that believed that, well, government made a promise. And so that promise is what is being assessed. Well, there were, there were range, uh, there, there, there were the grace actually giving to government on this pass was actually between 5 and 3.5. That's how uh, government scored in terms of infrastructure. And then they went on to talk about sanitation. In terms of sanitation, they mentioned the sanitation fund, which the government promised in its manifesto to establish. That has not been uh, achieved. But some of them were the fact that we're, we're of the view that sanitation is indeed a big problem. But negative response to efforts by government or subse subsequent governments to remove the source of filth in Accra is actually a problem. Well, Mr. Amate feel they believe that society seems to be in denial. Because anytime government makes the choice to remove people, the same media and the same society will come back and uh, hit back at government. That score there was between 3.5 well between 3 and 3.5 as well and then now they're talking about roads and the score for governments there has been between 2 and 4 over 10. Let's watching our continuing coverage of our special program called the score card where we're assessing government performance so far at the moment we've been talking uh, we've, we've actually already spoken about agriculture and rural development education the economy at the moment we're discussing infrastructure and social services momentarily we'll be talking also about the justice system when Kujo Yangson and Samson Ladia in and they take over from Efia Pukia and uh, Evans Mensah we'll be going back to them momentarily but before that